So if you're looking at the length of this video and you're thinking, man, this is a long video. Well, this isn't a tutorial. You're tuned into Hops Cutter TV with your host, Master Z on Windsor Zero One. So in this uh, extended infomercial, we'll be talking about some of the changes that have taken place from 00983 to 00984, just a small decimal point, but the foundation for the future of what Hops is to become. So this piece right here was just a little star door I made, just kind of playing around with an idea. Sometimes I'll mentally be thinking about Blender when I'm sitting on the couch watching TV or sitting on a couch using Blender or on the kiosk using Blender, or, uh, on the dining room computer using Blender or in the office computer using Blender, not using Blender, but moving my hands as if I am using Blender. But in any of these situations, I'm often thinking about things I could be uh, giving a try to. So this was kind of one of those uh, kind of mental exercises that I went through. So just to show it in action, we're just going to go down and just break this down before we begin in the video. So uh, mod scroll has been combined into bull scroll and toggle modifiers, consolidating some of the buttons. A large theme of this re release has been consolidating buttons. Uh, more than likely, we'll be re-implementing them in the form of uh, smart tools in the future. Um, but that concept is still being worked on. However, at this time, um, I do just want to preface this video by saying that a large theme of this has been uh, not only expansion, but also consolidation to try to simplify hops and get a little bit slimmer to uh, make it easier on new users coming in. But anyways, back to the content at hand. So for this shape, I started off with a bevel. And then from here, we use a displace to push it over. And then a screw modifier in order to extrude it upwards. At this point, I'm going to press Alt-V in order to turn on wireframe, we'll just take a look at this. And then we'll use a screw or we use a curve in order to deform this around. So when it came to the curve, the resolution of the curve is highly important in order to get a good curvature going here, because otherwise these areas will just be bent into nothingness. The next thing after that was a decimate in order to clean up the amount of segments and try to minimize what was going on here. Now, this is where things began to get interesting. So after this, I did a displacement. And then I did a Boolean operation where I actually duplicated the ring on this, extended it out, turned it into a solid piece, joined it back using an additive Boolean, but then used a weld modifier to join them together. So everything's looking kind of weird, right? But so far, so good, actually. So the next thing, of course, is mirror it to the other side. And then, of course, fill in this gigantic hole. So for that, I just added a Boolean onto it and then cut it off in order to get what we're looking at here. And so now I have this entire manifold, basically non-destructive piece. And then it's just a matter of me going through and just cutting details. In fact, for right here, I kind of utilize the same trick except using it as an inset. So we'll just go through, just scrubbing through our modifiers here. But I just wanted to kind of show just how I've been experimenting with the weld modifier and how it could possibly be fit in interesting places in the workflow. Also right here, you can see I have a second mirror. You can also see that I deleted the O off of it because we still have to remove one of our letters in order to add multiple variants of a modifier. And that's one of the things I asked for in between this release, but you know, we'll double back for that. There's so many things added to this that there's already a two hour video. So just getting all the things that I asked for would uh, fill up an entire new whiteboard, but I am always pleased with the work that the team has done and their continued toleration of working with me. So it is with great pleasure that I, you know, present the um, changes that have come with Hardop 00984. All right, so one of the first changes to Hardops is the QRES or the uh, curve res being added to the Q menu. So we'll tab in edit mode and I'm just going to duplicate this Q, bring it forward, control numpad or control alt numpad minus, and then we'll bring in another Q, bring it up here and just control alt numpad minus and bring in another Q and you get the idea. And for this one, we'll actually use the edit mode option of slash to slash this piece out. And we'll just push that forward a little bit 
and then use Control Alt Down Pad Plus in order to additively join that. And we just have this kind of shape we created, right? Of course, I'll press Alt V to bring up the Hard Ops Viewport sub menu, and I'll choose EVHQ to improve the viewport appearance. And everything's already been applied here. And this area right here, we probably just want to push this face up or down, one of the two, or just get rid of it. But things were just getting a little bit messy here. So just going to rebuild this before we continue. Sometimes I could see uh, geometric issues before they happen. So we just want to keep everything rolling smoothly. And so that's about it. So now we have our shape here. If we bring out a plane, we could scale that. And with the Q menu, choose array. And we'll press Z to make it go up on the Z. And then press SZ to bring it down. And that's the wrong Z. We'll press G, Z, S, Z. We'll select this in the main object, Q, and select knife in order to put a series of loop cuts throughout this model evenly. You know, if we were able to control R and put loop cuts all the way up and down a model, that would just be amazing. But that is something I would consider to be dicing. So we'll press Shift A and bring out a Bezier curve. And I, I like to bring curves over so that way they have their starting point exactly at the start of the curve instead of being offset. And so with our curve being built here, we'll select the object, select the curve, and press Control P and choose Curve to Form, which is part of the parent menu of selecting objects and curves. And we can see that it's deforming on the wrong axis in every test and five outtakes, it's been on the wrong axis. So we'll change that to Z because that's the right axis every time. And we'll press S, Z, or S, Z to scale it on the Z, G, Z to move it on the Z. And here we are deforming our object along this curve. So we can move this handle to control the deformation. And we've taken this basic Boolean object kind of forced geometry into it and now we're curving it. So because of the way this object looks, we'll need to affect its shading. So we'll bam, hit it with a little bit of sharpen. But the curve is actually controlling the resolution of the deformation, but it's something that isn't normally taken into consideration. So that has now been added to the Q menu. So when you're in one of these situations, you can see that lowering the resolution actually lowers the subdivision of the curve affecting the overall result of the deformation here. And so now you can get something much smoother all from the Q menu without having to exit full screen to go into your properties panel. But you can also press control tilde and modify these settings here in the hard ops curve helper. But that's pretty much it for it as far as the new curve resolution options being added to the Q menu. Do take advantage of it for all your curve deformation needs. When using mark in edit mode, control clicking adds a bevel. This much you probably have already known. However, if you press one, it'll set it to be at a profile of 0.5, which is something that normally you'd probably want by default on setting a, a pr particular type of bevel. However, pressing one a second time while in edit mode will also push the bevel inward, resulting in an interior bevel. This can be useful for a myriad of things from creating half pipes to uh, creating curved level pieces, which i uh, shown in previous videos. However, this has now been added as a thing that you can now use when dealing with bevel in edit mode. One of the things you can definitely say about Bongiorno is he loves his Booleans. So one of the first things he did upon joining our team was add edit mode support for slice and inset. So if you have an object selected in edit mode and you press Q, you can go and use difference union and slash. Slash is now added to edit mode. Inset is added to edit mode in addition to knife. Intersection has been added at the bottom because it is my least favorite operation, but still exists because AR prefers that it exists. Slash is here just so you can just separate your objects. And then, you know, I like to actually use it to separate things, scale them around and then reunion them to fit the shape and keep everything manifold. 
in fact right there I might have uh, created a small issue let's try that again there we go now it actually create a full manifold shape without an interior edge also in edit mode you have the ability to use knife which we'll bring up now knife in the form of intersect which will no longer nuke your materials at least compared to box cutter so in this case we'll just add a quick blank material and we'll just bring a cube in and we'll just use knife and notice that we don't have an issue with the materials due to the way that box cutter actually cuts using a data transfer process that was still in the process of being refined hard ops doesn't actually have those problems so one of the main reasons i actually wanted some of these features that were already being worked on in box cutter over in hard ops is because on hard ops we're able to examine every step of the process and focus more laser-like on some of these bugs and ensure that they don't exist. So, you know, part of uh, box cutter is, is just so fast, but with hard ops, you're, you're able to select things and, and work procedurally, work slowly. And one thing I talk about in videos is how old habits die hard. And while box cutter is my favorite tool to just jump in and use, I actually have it disabled at this very moment because today's all about hard ops. So we're just getting in here and just playing with just some of the basic tools and talking about what's new here. So we can shift as snap our cursor to select it, bring the cube here, Q, inset, and this area will be pushed inward. And we can bring in another cube and, you know, just to test it out, we'll bring this down and do an outset, which can be activated by shift clicking on inset and we have an outset, which is basically turning this into a geometric extrusion. But that is the new edit mode operations in a nutshell, which I think is just quite a fun time. I do enjoy modeling, taking things and extruding them onto each other, and then using them together, getting a manifold object, which kind of shows a whole new angle to using ingons that I never quite understood before. So Bongiorno definitely fits at home on our team working with boolean tools since that was one of the things we kind of uh, broke in with before uh, kind of expanding into all aspects of workflow however the tools that he made are definitely going to live on in hops and already i feel have made quite an impact on my experience with getting in here and just creating simple shapes and putting things together without a whole lot of issue as well as having the ability to use the f6 panel In addition to edit mode operations, the object mode variants of those same tools that we just discussed, inset and outset, have been added. However, you do have the added benefit of non-destructive performance and being able to have the dynamic Q menu there for you for adjusting these things as needed. In addition to being able to hide it, selecting the object and rolling it back with mod bull scroll you are able to really quickly get in there and just create these objects procedurally while being able to adjust them on the fly. Some of the same benefit is already offered in box cutter. However, with hard ops, we are able to experiment a little bit more internally without such heavy constraint on overlapping systems that could possibly be points of failure whenever we do get in there and begin testing things. So usually I like to take an idea into hops perfect it a little bit, and then take what works back over into box cutter. So the comparisons are purely intentional. So selecting these two, we'll just do a slash and we'll add another cube here. Select these two and do an inset. Bring up the panel here and adjust the settings to choose what we keep here. And in addition to that, inset has also been given its own hotkey of alt shift numpad slash, which we are working on some sort of unified system that'll help your fingers relax in the future. But alt shift numpad slash will also activate inset. And then you can go into the F6 panel and make adjustments, in which case it almost looked like a difference for a second. But if there is a geometric issue, then more than likely, that means you may have to get in and lower these settings to something a little bit more reasonable. 
Someday I hope to put a little bit of a brain behind it where these sort of things can be auto detected and settings clamped in order to notify the user. There might be some sort of geometric mishaps happening. But for level one, I believe this is a fantastic attempt. All throughout the time Bon J was working on this stuff, I was telling him, hey, I think you did good enough. We can uh, wrap it up. But he just wanted to take it a little bit further. Mad kudos to the team for working even throughout Christmas Day. I apologize for being so much of a slave driver, but I am eternally committed to making this the perfect tool for everyone who purchased it and make them glad that they are a hard ops user. So I am glad for everyone's support and this very video itself is uh, a token of my gratitude for everyone who recently purchased it and showed their enthusiasm over this most recent update. I felt it, it was such a massive change it was necessary to get in and show not only what's new but also give a small recap on just the hard ops workflow and how we should be getting in here and playing with things nowadays because old systems while being moved aside are definitely not being forgotten and all workflows are always considered. So our toll is determined to move forward without having any sort of regression. Regression, I believe, is the worst case scenario to go back on an idea is to um, you know admit defeat. So, but in some cases, there is no other choice. For example, having Alt W toggle the grid was probably a bad choice. That was probably a power user level decision there, but everybody makes mistakes. In addition to being supported in object mode, there is the whole hops tool aspect to using these booleans that have been added. So if we bring out hops tool and we select these two objects, you can see that there are new icons here before it used to be just red, yellow, and green. So if we click on inset, you can see that an inset operation was performed. However, more than likely we need to adjust the F6. So the hops tool integration is still something that's experimental and I'll be going over that later in the video. However, for, for the most seamless workflow, you could either access it through the shift Q pi menu, which will give you the resulting F6 panel for getting that fine adjustment because sometimes you just find the the wrong setting, the wrong number that just causes this to fail. But over time, Solidify is getting better and better. And I'm just pleased with what Blender is able to accomplish with its improvements to the hard surface workflow and what it affords to us because our tools continue moving forward, not because of um, us, but because of Blender itself continuing to improve. But with that, we'll move on to the next tool. Sort was one of those things that was afforded to us with the improvements that came to Blender with 2.8, like the miter improvements and weighted normal and such. So the first version of sorting only would sort the last version of the bevel modifier in addition to all the ones that we had listed and had cases for. When it comes to sorting, the easiest way to explain it is we will prioritize the placement of booleans before these particular modifiers. So to really discuss it in order is um, we, we place booleans before bevels, we place booleans before arrays, we place booleans before mirrors, we place booleans before solidify. In this case, with it being unchecked, we place them after solidify. We place them before weighted normals. We place them after simple to form. We place them post triangulate or pre triangulate. We post them probably post decimate. It's unchecked for a reason. But when it comes to these particular modifiers, they are placed and not placed in accordance to the booleans when it comes to your modifier stack. So all of these are relating to where you want them to be placed in accordance to Boolean. So, you know, you're not really choosing how you want your modifier stack to be sorted in general, which that's something that we're already having discussions on. It really is how you want them to have Booleans placed in accordance to these already existing. So the first level, we would just actually reorder these according to the Boolean, which was actually a bit of a mess. So the next level added last level bevel, which would actually allow you to sort your modifiers 
in accordance to the final bevel, meaning that if you had more than one bevel modifier, the previous levels wouldn't be disrupted. With level three, we had a deep discussion about where we wanted sort to go. And so as a result, sort bevels with V groups and only verts is just particularly ignored. And what this means is that when it comes to sorting, we do not move these around. It has been determined that moving bevels that are associated with V groups have no improvement on the model. In fact, most of the time it results in the bevel just simply being disabled because it's being shifted to a state in which the mesh data just isn't present anymore for those V groups. So we just keep those exactly where they are. When it comes to beveling verts, if you're beveling verts, more than likely that's at the lowest level of the stack and you don't want to move it because it's going to look like a disaster anywhere else that you place it because wherever you place it is specifically where you would want it. Now, if this sounds like an incredibly long explanation, the simple way to look at sort is that sort is like this brain that helps us keep modifiers in check. So if I were to just control click add a bevel here and then bring in the Cuban and select this object and use a difference from the Q menu, you can see that on this cube, the Boolean modifier is actually placed before the bevel. And you can tell that because the cut is being beveled by the object. And when sort works, it's just fantastic. In fact, the idea for sort, or at least the way I talk about it internally is users shouldn't have to talk about or think about sort. Sort should be just, you turn it on, you check the box, you let it go. If you have an error, you find out which modifier has an issue and you deal with that one by either turning off its sort or by disabling sort on the modifier level, which for sort, there's a backdoor in which if you disable the renderability, which I know renderability, terrible, but if you disable the renderability, it will bypass sort and make the modifier not be sorted no matter what. So once we have this in there as some sort of external property, this will be amazing. In fact, as I talk about it, I'm already thinking of more ideas for improving sort. But continuing on, uh, while having sort on, we also added the ability to bypass sort because like I said, we don't want people to have to think about sort, even in cases of bypassing. So for example, let's say I want to cut this cube in, but I do not, I do not want it to be affected by this bevel. So by control clicking difference, I can actually bypass the sort and have this place in an interim state where basically the bevel is not affecting this particular cut. And by taking advantage of this particular state, I can control shift click bevel, which will actually add a 60 angle that will grab this just where I need it, giving me the result that I need. But the previous bevel is actually a little too simple and that's why it is being caught by this new modifier. So now we have this individual area that's being isolated, but the shading's off, right? So this is where me and AR differentiate on thought a little bit, but I would actually go in and shift click the weighted normal to add one with keep sharp, which will fix the shading, allowing me to keep working with a beautiful model on screen. And so we take this and when we cut this in, instead of it cutting to this big bevel that we have, it's actually going to cut to this last level bevel. And this is because sort V3 actually extends to sort the last level of all of these modifiers, which means that if you create a model non-destructively and you're using multiple iterations of the same modifiers, which believe me, it happens, it will only sort the last version of that one in the stack. And even more than that, you can disable which ones in the stack you want to be sorted by turning off the renderability. Uh, most of the time when I'm rendering, I actually render in a viewport. However, if I do take it all the way to the bank, I need to make sure to deal with those modifiers, which we need to probably deal with the system for that. But, you know, we'll just bypass sort. And notice that when I bypass sort, that this modifier was placed before the weighted normal. So we're talking about now a second level of sort. So there's actually larger rules that's been established in hard ops that are slightly experimental, depending on if we get complaints, that will determine if certain modifiers will be sorted, even if sorting isn't even in place. Because having a Boolean before your weighted normal looks like that, and that never looks good. No one wants to look at that. So having 
us sort that on all levels just ensures that you have a smooth result all throughout your entire workflow. This is based off of criticisms and comments I saw through solenoid videos where people struggled and had a hard time with shading. They would send me their blend files. Their blend files would have terrible shading. It's like, you know what? We're going to make a tool to fix that. We're going to make a tool to fix that and we're going to fix that on a level that fixes it for them. So. Hopefully it works out. So with this object selected, we're just going to control shift click and put a bevel that's isolated just to this area. Notice that the bevel, even though it's an additive bevel that's being added, it's being added on top of the stack, but before the weighted normal. So even bevel has had special considerations taken with sort. So when we say sort V3, we mean it. Our sort extends into the way modifiers are added, it extends into the way that booleans are added, it extends into the way that we transition between states on our model. For example, just to show something that we haven't got to yet, if I press Q and I choose shift bool, we jump over to a slash and you can see that the result is already exactly where I want it for me to duplicate this cube, select this new slash and bypass that sort, select this object and control shift click to add a bevel on top of that bevel, giving me the sort of artistic control that doesn't require me to think about the UI over here. In fact, there's a whole troubleshooting aspect to things as well that I hope to emphasize more in the future. But for now, this could serve as a cursory overview on sort V3 and basically what it means to you in hard ops and box cutter and kit ops and why we value it so heavily and why we push so hard to have it consistent across all the tools because when it's working, it is a dream. And when it's not working, then people are asking questions about how to sort work. Where's the documentation for sort? Um, is there a way I can do this with sort or that with sort? But believe me, uh, a lot of the suggestions that users have had, we have implemented into this particular version. So I do look forward to hearing if you have any further improvements on what you would like sort to be. But for now, this is the next level of sort, sort V3. Sometimes I give the team tasks that I believe they perceive to possibly be stupid, you know, because they don't entirely make sense. You know, I don't entirely explain what it is that I need it for or why or the problem that I'm solving. But, you know, most of the time that these cases come up, it's because I'm solving cases that I see happen from people following tutorials and expressing their difficulty because, you know, these videos aren't me trying to show off and I mean the ones that are sped up and time lapse with music those are me just casually working but um, you know for the most part I'm not doing these videos to show off or make you feel like you're at a disadvantage as a modeler because I truly do want you to model at least the stuff that I'm presenting to you so one of the problems that I saw with a, a lot of people doing the solenoid video was issues with the weighted normal becoming misplaced in their modifier stack. So we'll bring up in our modifier stack and more than likely I don't have weighted normal. Bam, I'm a liar. I have weighted normal. And I have weighted normal in a lot of places here. And you know, we're just gonna move it up the stack. Because in the previous versions of hard ops, this would happen a lot. You would just have your weighted normal just accidentally in the wrong place on the wrong side of town you know and the results would just not be acceptable so i'm just moving these up the stack you know i would never do this willy-nilly or willingly like this but for the purpose of demonstration let's just, let's just say you, you have your model and it's shaded strange and you're like man i really want to present this but it just doesn't look right um well, the task that I gave Bonjay, one of his first tasks was I want people to select, be able to select everything and just go in their modifier panel, which right is right here, and just shift click weighted normal in order to fix it on everything. And so that's now a thing. You could just select everything. You could select, including your lights, your light probes, your empties, everything. And just shift click wait 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 it normal i mean you should really select what you want to do it with but the thing is is that i was pretty adamant about putting some sort of filter in there and preventing you know the customer from facing errors 
when using these sort of things. So just know that any time that you're shading is just out of whack. If the previous sort doesn't help you, which it should on the next cut, then weighted normal is there for you to help you get your shading just right. In cases where weighted normal is of course able to help your shading get just right. There are cases where weighted normal can fail but I just wanted to at least demonstrate that there's been some improvements with it where if you use weighted normal on objects that already have weighted normal, it will remove them from the stack and place them back at the end, resulting in the shading being restored on everything that was in your selection. All right, don't test me on this because hypothetically I could be lying and this could be a failure, but lazy selection should be also supported across uh, all modifiers. So for example, if I choose array and we array this box, even with these irradiance probes selected, you can see that I am perfectly able to get the result that I want. And if we look at our modifier stack, the weighted normal is already being pre-sorted on a daddy sort level, resulting in us being able to get multiple boxes without any issue. So shout out to Bonjay for making this work perfectly because I did not even test it beforehand on this particular demonstration. So radial array is one of those things we still discuss heavily internally because I want to make it as easy as the mirror tool. So we'll just shift A, add a cube right here. It will bring it over here and cut it in. And our 3D cursor is already in the center of this particular face. And if we go inside the Q menu, you can see that there's an option for circular array. The option for launch into this place has been removed because of the shift to call array menu. However, the control to use 3D cursor as origin has now been improved to no longer displace the object whenever you use the 3D cursor. This was something that was driving me crazy before. We still have to get the arrays to play with radial nicely, but now you can actually get in here and keep your 3D cursor position and the object original position without having something like this happen where your object is being displaced because of the displacement which isn't actually needed. So that's just disabled for the time being, which should actually make your lives easier if you're still coming to terms with the new radial array. New, new radial array coming soon. One of the things that I find myself doing a lot is leaving full screen in order to go to the light settings and change my light from a square to a rectangle because that option isn't yet available in the right click menu which I just love by the way. But yeah, when they add an option to change things to square there, I'll be so happy. But in the meantime, pressing Q will now have an option for area lights to change the shape. So if you need to change this to be a square, which a square has different rules, you can go in here and change it to a rectangle. It just makes your life just a little bit easier. In addition to that, of course, you can turn on contact shadow and lower your energy. But that's just one of the small changes made to the lights in the cube menu. Two of the largest mainstays in hard ops has been C sharp and S sharp. However, upon looking at hard ops as a, as a whole over the course of this last release cycle, it became apparent that things became rather dense, that hard ops became a little more convoluted than we wanted it to be presented to users for what we wanted to do. For example, having S sharp in the menu just results in us being able to shade and smooth and mark edges, kind of a hard surface set smooth in a way. And C sharpen is like a hard surface set smooth, but you throw a bevel on top of that and you also apply modifiers. And so having two of these options in the main menu, while something that we pushed for a very long time is something that maybe wasn't the best idea and having custom verbiage may have made it even more of a hurdle for new users to get into. So as a result, I finally gave up and decided, you know what, let's finally break apart just the one thing I've never been wanting to relent on. The verbiage of sharpen and C sharpen and S sharpen and what it was and what it was that we wanted it to be. And 
you know, uh, aside from incremental improvements, S sharpen and C sharpen remain primarily the same. You know, you run C sharpen, it will, you know, adjust certain modifiers on your mesh, and you can use the F6 to choose how you want it. The sharpening options of S sharpen are still down here. And for the most part, we wanted to take this stuff forward, but we wanted to also let go of some of the weight that caused this to become a little bit heavier. And you can also see that it changed the color of the icon, which indicates that you are now in the C sharp workflow. So over the course of 2.8, I've been determined to kind of let that go. So if you look at most of the videos in the hard ops playlist of 2.8, you'll notice that my icon really goes over to orange, which means that I've been kind of outside of the reservation because I've been really emphasizing to you guys more on just using the power of modifiers and then finally applying things at the right time in order to get the results that you want. So as a result, we can finally lower this and press Q and show you sharpen. So if we hover over it, you can see the tooltip, shift is, or click is sharpen, control is S sharpen, shift is resharp, and control plus shift is C sharp classic plus B with, which if you're used to applying C sharpen and jumping to B with in the same operation, that's basically what it is. But ReSharp is one that I also am a big fan of, and I'm finally glad to have been able to convince AR to allow it to be the shift behavior because it personally does make a lot of sense to me. So to just show it in action, you know, Blender is actually capable of, you know, I have to make something a little more complex than this, but if we were to um, just create some instant complexity here, So something like that, you know, we'll just uh, mirror it to the other side. And so Blender has always had the ability to select sharp edges based off of a particular angle. However, the question on what you do next is up to you, which in my case is to mark it as a crease, mark it as a weight, mark it as a seam, mark it as a sharp. And going through and doing that over and over manually every time you select sharps was something that just got tedious at the very beginning. And that's what actually brought me and AR together was him teaching me sharpening, me turning it into a basic tool, and then him working with me for years to turn it into an advanced tool. And so now we finally have taken that to the next level. So really guys, there is no going back. There is adding emulation behaviors, but I plan to address that stuff via a multi-tool in the future. But for now, Sharpen has changed, but for the most part, Sharpen has not. But with our sharp edges selected, we can go in here and we can mark crease and move the mouse all the way over to set it to one. And then control E, mark bevel weight and move our mouse all the way over, set that to one, mark it as seam, mark it as sharp. And now we've basically have done the work that we would do just choosing these and just marking them as sharp. So just selecting an object just marking sharp will just mark it as sharp however the resharpen is also very nice so i just want to show you that real quick in the event that you have marked some edges and you want to just recalculate you can just shift click it and it'll actually jump into s sharpen with additive mode off which well, i was adamant about making this part of s sharpens additive mode because it's always been that way you know there i go being uh, stuck in my old ways, I got to relent. That's part of being being on a team is being able to relent on these sort of things. I, I, I must admit that sometimes I am a little stubborn. Now C sharpen is activated on control, which we can see on the tool tip. This is where things begin to change. If we hold control and we click it, you can see that modifiers get applied, but there is no longer the bevel being applied. So finally, at the very last second, I was like, look AR, just you got to add a bevel modifier people are going to want to add a bevel modifier so it could jump into this workflow people are going to miss being able to go in taking cubes cutting in and then control clicking and jumping into c sharp to apply it of course mirror it to the other side and just continuing on their merry way because this was our cut and go workflow and i still use this in cases where I'm very confident about the direction that I'm taking a design and I plan on working only one way and the results that I want are the results that I'm aiming for uh, without needing to go back non-destructively in the stack. You know, I do it a little bit less now. Sometimes I'll actually work for a stage 
And right here, this is actually still here until I control click it and then it's been applied. And I can actually S sharp and then just come over here and click C sharp and then it'll apply it. There is also the ability to customize this inside of preferences. So if we bring that up, you can see that S sharpening can be customized to your perfection. So for me, I actually have control and shift set to C sharp bevel, which is basically C sharp classic, just as a fallback until I can finally just let things go. But really you should just C sharp it, which will apply everything plus It'll apply everything plus mark the sharp edges and then you would just add your bevel with be with it's just that easy however i also like to set sharp to be clear sharp and so to show you that one in action we'll go ahead and close preferences and if i hold alt and i click sharpen you can see that all the sharp markings are removed so in the event that i want to use this as a bull shape on something else you know maybe i don't want to cut in those sharp marked edges because they'll affect the weighting of the subsequent object that I'm affecting. So in those cases, I would want to just alt click sharpen and just keep the sharpening only on the main object and keep the bull shapes relatively neutral. Depending on the circumstance, I may want to go in and mark some overrides, but for the most part, I would just keep everything fairly self self contained. But with that, that covers the most of the changes to sh sharpen, C sharpen, and S sharpen in a nutshell. For those diehard users who just want the old commands back, just know that they are still here under the operations. Uh, I am quite against removing old code, so they do exist as kind of a history lesson. I want to do speed comparisons with them in the future compared with the new system in order to make sure that they're definitely an optimal replacement but we definitely want users to at least give it a shot and give us their insight on if they run into issues with it or what they like with it, what they don't like. But um, there was quite a few things that came up during testing that at the very last second, we went ahead and jumped in and made changes for like, for example, uh, this is irrelated, but uh, one of the people I sent a test version to, um, the version had in our double object selection menu, Booleans was replacing different. So instead of just pressing QD, which I never did, but he responded, QD is gone. I was like, QD. I was like, oh wait, Q Q and difference. It's like, yeah. It's like it's now Q B D. And he was actually getting into it and started to, you know, acclimate very fast, but it made me realize, wow, I'm really messing up the sauce here. And that's one of our rules is we don't want to really rock the boat too much i mean we do want to keep our tool evolving but we don't want to uh disrupt long-time users and people who have spent time actually mastering this tool just to make it cater to newcomers but i do feel that consolidating c sharp and s sharp into just sharpen alone will keep this workflow focused just in this particular area allowing us to expand much further in the future in multiple directions so i do hope you know users just at least stick with us and you know continue giving us their insight as far as what works and what doesn't work but i do have a couple of ideas myself as ways to bring new tools forward that actually have connections to legacy behaviors because you know we lost classic c sharp and i still liked it because some of the greatest cubes ever were made that way but that's a talk for another day so with that we'll move on to the next thing So random material is just one of those things. One of those things that if you have objects selected and you press Alt-M, it's one of the options in the Alt-M menu. Material link's also there in case you need to link all your materials, but that's um, more of a classic feature. But I do plan on revisiting this down the road and optimizing it to work a little bit better for our current needs. But today we're talking about blank material. So blank material previously would assign a just a random material of just randomly generated parameters on every object but it would be the same material now if you use it it actually puts a random material on every single object per object which is actually an improvement over the previous version this was the way it was initially however i requested that it was removed and i realized later on that it was actually a mistake so someday in the future i want to add the ability to shuffle materials as well for example, like every time I'm doing this, I'm creating a different material, 
but I would like to actually just reshuffle the existing material and just scroll it through a modal until I find a set of materials I like and just play with looks and just keep turning this into this uh, kind of experimental look dev tool. But I'm so grateful for Proxy2 uh, for his uh, dedication of time and energy to helping this get perfected because I just am I'm thrilled to have this thing now because you know a lot of my work involves me just creating just little test objects and just throwing blank materials on it and blank material is just so great for texturing little knickknack paddywhack give a cube a material so if you were to stop me on the street and ask me what's hops i would say what and then i would say oh it's a uh, smart menu so when it comes to our smart menu, we'll delete this cube, we'll just bring a plane down. We used to have an option in here called 2D Bevel. And 2D Bevel is actually a modified version of Bevel. And it was previously here as well. I'll, I'm just letting you know that it's been removed and it's no longer needed because that behavior has been consolidated into Bevel. Uh, we did a little bit of work to Bevel in order to improve it for this version, but now you're able to go in here and just use it on 2D objects and it'll detect that it's a two-dimensional object as long as it's not rotated in an advanced degree. And you'll be able to use the thin Q menu to just get started with adding thickness and setting your shape up for you to get to cutting and adding your multiple levels. This is a particular test experiment that I go through quite often where I will set up a cube and stack a solidify, stack a bevel, and begin cutting it to test the sorting and to ensure that certain things are prioritized and also the multi-leveling capabilities in addition to being able to jump my smoothness up to 60, which will ease the transition with beveling. The alternative is actually adding more segments, but if you're transitioning at 60, it's a little bit easier for you. But just to discuss the uh, transition of bevel to uh, having 2D bevel behaviors, well, and the removal of 2D bevels. I know this may be jarring to some of you, but it may be removed, it may be added in the future if the need comes up for it, but I really don't think it is. Uh, for the goal of a lot, a lot of things in this release was consolidation. Late Parent is one of those things that I had written on the list that I wanted as a particular feature. So we'll just bring this cube in and we'll just cut inside of it and we'll duplicate it bring it here you know I'm just so partial to just difference but really insets also a good time also I'll need to sharpen that but continuing on we'll uh, take this object duplicate it bring it over here difference here and we'll scale this up big time just you know randomness we'll select these two and set that as an inset and believe me there's still some gems to go over in this i just kind of am going over this in the form of a list so it could be uh even more boring than it's supposed to be uh, for which i must apologize so here we have our object and we move our object around and you see that all the booleans stay behind in box cutter this issue doesn't happen because you know we solved it there um you know I try to complain about these issues on both sides to try to get them solved. And sometimes one side really gets it solved because I'll complain exceptionally hard uh, to Proxy, who's leader of Team Box Cutter right now. But when it comes to dealing with this, there, there's a couple of ways you can do it. You know, you can press Alt-H, bring back your cutters, which I'll need to press layer three, then layer one, or in this case, layer two, then layer one. And I can select everything, select the main cube, and we could just um, control P, object key transformation, and that'll fix this. However, you know, there's an easier way. So right now, you can see I undid everything. So really, um, this object has the Boolean targets, not children of it. If you go under the Q menu in operations, there's an option called late parent that is experimental, but will parent the cutters to the object in certain situations. Let's try that again. Let's try that again. Maybe what it is is I select these, then I go to layer one, select the target, 
then late parent. And now these are parented to it. So for a moment, I forgot how this worked. However, I'll be checking into that because the first scenario was also supposed to work, but I bet it was a little bit more complicated to pull off than uh, I initially anticipated. But that's something that we'll be revisiting in the future. But that is late parent, which at this time is something that's able to assist you with getting your children parented to your object. Uh, kind of similar to the control P option. However, I'm pretty sure that inside of our option, there's some sort of smart selection that'll make sure that even if you have just the third selection in it and the last option is a cutter, that'll still locate which one is the target and do that because that's the same kind of smart behavior we've been trying to implement in box cutter. But I assure you, we will be revisiting that in the future. But I did just mention just right before this recording that we need to get the parent behavior inherent in hard ops so the users can actually choose that off the bat, not even run into this behavior behavioral problem. Reset Access has received some improvements in this version. So we'll just uh, shift right click to place our 3D cursor there. We'll just place the object here just, you know, because if we press Q and we go under mesh tools, reset access is placed prominently right across from mesh tools. You can press H to see help while inside this modal. And if you press C to snap the cursor, the object will now snap the cursor. For some reason, this was an issue over in 2.8 and now it's actually been resolved. You can also see that text has been added to the bottom because I'm just obsessed now with having snitch text show up everywhere to let users know what's going on because over in box cutter, I'm just not seeing enough text action happening. So I definitely am trying to do something about that personally. All right, so this particular feature is array support for plane. So previously when you had a plane and you used array, you would actually have to press C and then Z in order to get it to go up like this. So that's actually been fixed as a result. It makes uh, using these sort of things for knife cuts just a lot easier. Uh, in fact, we select the plane again and this time it's located here. And the part where it resets the axis still drives me crazy, but I do want to get that thing rewritten down the road. So it's just one of the things on the task list, but just know that I have my eye on it. So we'll select both of these, choose knife, and that is going to be the precursor of the bisect tool. And I just can't get over doing that. It's one of the greatest things I've been shown. And I, it's, it's so much better than the grid thing that I was using. I was also using grid with custom cutter, which I also love and probably will integrate that into the simple tool idea. But this one definitely takes the cake as the dicer because this will help us deform everything. So there I was, I believe, Christmas Eve, you know, preparing the uh, final release, trying to get the director's cut taken care of. And Imperfect Link writes me and tells me about a feature he wanted to add to hard ops called uh, two box that was just not quite right. And so I was like, why would we add such a thing? And so as he explained to me that all it does is just take an object and just puts a box around it. Uh, you know, my mind started actually coming up with ideas on things it could be used for. But for now, all to box does is just creates a box around an object. It doesn't replace the object, but it just gives you a quick box in the position of the object, in the shape of the object. Not not trying to play off a cube blocker, by the way, here. I know cube blockers also dealing with some parametric shapes. Uh, for us, I want to take it in a slightly different direction, but just know that we're definitely not trying to, um, you know, move on them or anything. Um, but the, it, it's purely coincidental and the idea I saw on it was, um, you know, more for just creating quick blocking shapes for uh, Boolean operations. But, you know, I do hope to expand more upon it in the future and have it work in, in coordination with the uh, objects that are offset from their central uh, origin locations, which is something you'll notice after playing with it for a while. But just the first version. So level one, you know, we'll come back and talk about it at level five. So when Bonjourno first started working with us, I was like, all right, well, 
you know, uh, what is it that you want to do? And he's like, I want to improve Booleans. Well, you know, we've already done a pretty good job with Booleans. So what is it that you want to improve with them? So he's like, well, I want to add a slice to edit mode. It's like, all right, well, I guess we could use that. Let's go ahead and add that. And so, you know, he added that and it was pretty nice. And, you know, we've been using it and I've been enjoying being able to use some of these operations in edit mode. And so the next thing was, um, you know, inset and outset and knife, which he also wanted to add to hard ops. And these were things that uh, were already present in box cutter, but I definitely wanted them present in hard ops as well, just because by having them hard ops, it gives us a, a second opportunity to uh, kind of evaluate how these tools work. And for example, having the knife from, here we go. Uh, if, if they're selected like that, you would actually do it from object mode. Let's, let's do that again. Knife. And then in the F6, choose knife project. And now we fired our knife all the way through it. So, you know, after adding knife, I was like, yeah, that's pretty good. Also, you know, I was kind of adamant about having a toggle in here and automatic detection that would make it use knife project on planes. But just now I, I checked to see if, and it still isn't there. However, I do remember putting it there and then now I see that it was removed and replaced with a toggle that you, the user, will now have to deal with. But just know that previously I had that dealt with automatically. So anyways, continuing on. So after adding that, um, he wanted to do more work with Booleans. He wanted to make them more interactive. So <clears throat> we were like, what do you mean more interactive? Um, you know, basically that's box cutter. And that's how, you know, everyone responded. However, you know, after seeing the interactive Boolean tool that he came up with, you know, I'm very pleased at him actually going in this direction because I feel that the interactive Boolean will be the way that Booleans can be approached in the future for newcomers that will be a little bit more accessible than the previous system and also offer all the options in one easy to scroll system. Like right here, I'm just pressing X, 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 just to find the right one I want, in which case I'm looking for outset. And then I'll just place one more box here. I'll press Alt V just to turn on EVHQ and get a better look at my scene here. And we'll just choose difference. And in addition to adding interactive Boolean, he ad he added the ability for us to select a bull shape and choose something like shift, which shift will default over to slash, but you can actually shift to any state. So you can actually change any Boolean into any state, even back into a mesh again. And this is something that, you know, when it was first added, it was like, you know, in a way, this is uh, something we've already done with box cutter, so it's almost like redundant work that isn't having to be done because we've already done it in box cutter and we've done it pretty good in box cutter. However, as he continues with it, I've become more and more en en enthusiastic with his attempt and feel that you know it can become just a completely different approach to the Boolean workflow altogether. In fact, right here, I need to actually select this shape and adjust the thick, adjust the thickness. Almost had a lisp there for a second. So we'll bring this up, just move this out, bring it here. Control Shift B is also the hotkey that will bring it up if you have multiple selection. So if you have two objects selected, you can just press Control Shift B and it will jump into difference where you can scroll through all the operations. However, you can also have two objects selected or three objects selected, like for example, like this. And then if you select it and initiate control shift B, it'll jump into slash, but you can always just scroll it backwards into say difference, which could be more appropriate here. Let's see which one, this one's the one I'm looking for. And I can see that the multiple intersect situation is also something that may have to be thought out in the future. So whenever it comes to integrating his tool into hard ops, initially we wanted to replace difference altogether with the modal. 
However, we found that by doing that, users found it jarring to do a Boolean operation and then have to click to apply it compared to doing a Boolean operation and being done. You know, uh, in final analysis, we determined that, you know, adding three clicks to Boolean wasn't worth having people have the ability to second think their operation when they've directly chosen what operation it would want to do. And in this example, doing difference, you know, if you choose to do difference, then more than likely you've chosen to do difference already in your head and you don't want to see slice or inset or union or something else instead you know we could probably ask some of the people who discovered some bugs so far if um you know they want to see the wrong bull by accident and the answer is definitely no so we are definitely committed to ensuring the right options showing at the right time so even if you're using control shift b you will get the right option or at least the option that we determine from your starting state so notice that if i select a difference right here and i go into bull shift it shifts over to slash because more than likely slash is exactly what you want you want the piece back that you lost so that you can say duplicate this cutter and just begin working this shape so with that, that covers interactive Boolean and bull shift in hard ops. So control shift B initially was the bevel helper. So in order to show that, I will just add a bevel onto this object. If we press control shift B, it'll bring up the bevel helper. So I must preface this by saying that these hotkeys that I demonstrate, I don't necessarily have I, I don't always hit with my fingers because, you know, if you look at control shift B on the keyboard, it's kind of, you know, if you hit that with one hand, that's like a strange claw hand gesture to really pound your keyboard with, you know, you could probably use that to kill a man, you know, you hit him five times, you know, I can't stop making that joke. I'm sorry. But, you know, with those sort of hotkeys, I typically map them to the mouse. However, the control shift B idea of having it be the bevel helper, I was particularly fond of. However, if bevels aren't present on an object, like we get rid of the bevel, we press this, you can see that the bevel helper doesn't come up. And, and uh, the first version of the bevel helper would actually add a bevel if there wasn't a bevel. So then you suddenly had a bevel to modify. So I felt that that was a bad behavior because in a way you received a bevel just for making it pop up. And in a way it made you regretful of having it pop up because like, oh snap, I don't want this bevel. Why am I suddenly having to modify a bevel just because I popped up a helper? So that was removed. So the, the hotkey was somewhat useful for situations where you need to control specific bevels. You know, you can actually expand it here and adjust the profile. We put in quick, quick settings below that can be expanded on. You can actually get rid of them if wanted, but I like going in here and clicking these. They're much faster than having to go in and drag these manually. However, this has been expanded immensely. So instead of it also being a bevel helper, if you have two objects selected, it will actually jump into something called interactive Boolean where you can scroll the mouse wheel in order to choose how far you want to go through. You can see in this situation that we have our inset set up and if we expand our toolbox here, we can choose to ignore our bevels and give this a bigger inset which gives us a more unique result. This is the same sort of thing I hope to see in box cutter. However, dealing with sort and bevel sort and ignore sort all on the fly while inside of a colored shape that's inside of a modal operator is just, who knows how long that's gonna take. That's gonna be tricky. But by having these on a click box, you're able to just really perfect these settings and get them exactly where you want. You can ignore the sort whenever you wanna just destroy things which in this case, we actually do want to ignore sort and just adjust our thickness just to get exactly where we want and voila. So that is interactive Boolean. So if you have two objects selected, you will activate interactive Boolean where you can just actually scroll through and get the particular um, Boolean operation that you want more on that later. However, if you have three objects selected, you will activate slash. So we will put two cubes here, select this, and just press Control Shift B, and we just get slash. That's it. It just jumps straight to slash. However, if we back up there, if you have three objects selected, it jumps to slash, but you can scroll it. 
and choose what kind of cut you actually want. So this type of versatility already existed in box cutter. However, by bringing it over to hard ops, we have the uh, capabilities of a controlled workflow along with the versatility of the dynamic shape changing, which is something I never thought I would see in hard ops. In fact, when I first saw it, I believe everyone on the team was like, oh my God, why, why was this made, Bonje? Why did you make this? We already have box cutter, but over time we immediately uh, have come around to it and now I look at it and I'm like wow this is the most accessible way for people to approach hard ups I feel so it's going to be huge that's that's what I told them so you know I'm hoping that you guys um, right here I have an issue with the bevel so what I want to do is when I put that in hold control bypass the sort but right here I have nothing selected because there's a pending boolean this actually overrides what is going on with the bevel as far as cases in your stack. So if I press Control Shift B, I will activate the bevel helper. However, it should have actually activated bull shift. So I may more than likely need to check into that. Let's actually remove the bevel and press it again. And yeah, now we're in bull shift. So more than likely I'll need to put a case in there to deal with that. But my goal is to make Control Shift B a smart key Proxy kind of uh, broke it down for me in a way was we've been, I've been trying to make tools that are smart. However, what I need to do is make tools that do what they're supposed to do and then create tools that handle those tools that have the brains because I've tried to put brains in the menus. I've tried to put brains inside of C sharpen and S sharpen. They've worked for the most part of guiding paths, but they've also created some small dependency issues that's made these tools harder to use. So we're trying to kind of reapproach how we path users in Blender to give them a path that's both free, but also allows for experimentation but also in the event that you're following a particular path that you're able to get exactly where you need to go without issue. So continuing on without bull scroll, uh, control shift B has been extended to all of the following that I just went over. So just to reiterate, we'll make a new file. So with nothing selected, control shift B does nothing. If there's a bevel, control shift B will be your helper where you can quickly jump in and just divide bevels in half or multiply them by two or just add additional segments, which I love to jump in the helper to do. But if you have multiple objects selected, it will jump into something called interactive Boolean. So if you're using the same mouse that I'm using, you could just press that, scroll to will, and it's just nuts. I love doing this on the laptop. That's why I made it where pressing X will definitely toggle these things because when I'm on the laptop, I'm just pressing X looking at these things. I'm always gonna go in and set. I mean, I don't know why I'm looking through different Booleans, but I, I, I like to pretend. I like to pretend I'm gonna make another choice, you know. But things like this, uh, definitely let me take a look at the workflow and examine what's going on here. Like for this case, I really think that maybe we want to experiment with where we're placing bevel in the stack because by having the ability to place bevel just a little bit lower, you see that we're able to get a much more rounded contour on this interior cut here, which is probably a better result. We give it just a little bit of thickness and you know, we're cooking with gas here and we have a, a nice bevel that's big on the outside and even bigger on the out on the inside here. But that for the most part is about control shift B in a nutshell. I hope that you are selecting two objects and pressing it and scrolling that wheel because it is just a hoot. In fact, before I get off of it, I do want to reiterate that one of the options that you see here is called knife project. So if we look at this, this is knife project and this one is intersect and special care has been taken to make wireframe show for these because normally you would perform these operations and it would happen so fast. You wouldn't know what happened, but really you just cut this geo into your model. So we found it imperative that you're able to see the wireframe during these operations. In fact, wireframe isn't showing because the object I'm using is a plane, but without with that, we can move on to the next thing. 
So in this particular situation, we have a mesh where I have the perimeter marked with sharp edges, and there's a mirror that is actually mirroring to the other side. And then there's all these pieces that are sticking up that are just kind of ugly. So if we were to just simply just make a smooth mod, it would, you know, we, we would add additional, you know, factor and iterations, and that's kind of the result we would get. And that, that's fine and dandy, but that's not the reason that I wanted Smooth Mod integrated into the modifier system in Hard Ops. It's actually because of the shift auto vertex group behavior. So whenever I drew up the concept for what I wanted with this, it was specifically to, whenever you shift click it, it creates a vertex group that omits this, omits this, and omits whatever is marked via the control tilde workflow sharp options here. So if you mark anything, that will not be added to the vertex group, making you only smooth the area in between all of these areas, kind of keeping the form. And so I use this quite a bit on a couple of models recently and found that just basically by using it here and actually turning it into a tool that it really validated why this thing needed to exist because having something like this is definitely a lot more manageable than what I would have if I just simply say, let's uh, copy this, take this, turn it off, and we just remove the vertex group. In fact, we have to remove the group like so. We can see that this thing completely loses all form, completely negates the purpose. So, I mean, I could go in and smartly paint a vertex group, but really, just getting something that gets me off to a starting point to kind of ease the geometry to get me to um, work a little bit more efficiently with subdivision was really the goal with improving on the smooth modifier as far as having it integrated into hard ops. This integration also extends to the Laplacian smooth, which I found also works good in some cases. In some cases it doesn't, but um, you know, if you are watching this part of the video, um, while dealing with some hard surface models of a uh, more organic nature, you know, do give it a try and let us know if there's other things that you think could improve it or could be added to the F6 special behaviors or considerations or omissions. Really the omissions and considerations are things that I'm really wanting to, um, kind of emphasize on with, uh, our tools going forward to try to give these things, uh, extendable behaviors that makes them more useful for practical situations in uh, commercial work. So without that, with that aside, we'll uh, move on to the next thing. Thanks to the efforts of Chip Walters and his Nitrox content, we'll just delete that cube, but thanks to Chip Walters and his Nitrox content, it kind of uh, brought Metaballs a little bit back more to the forefront, at least as far as my attention and things I was thinking of. So as a result, it did make it become known that when you press control tilde, the helper didn't actually support metaballs before. So now we do have control tilde support for metaballs. So we can now go in here and divide our resolution. And just to kind of show what I've been doing with metaballs is I'll go in here and just make these really random shapes, you know, like this is like a piece of a turkey, but, um, just goofing off here, we'll press Control A and make this a real mesh. And we'll go out of full screen, breaking my rule. And under Remesh, we're going to choose Quad. And we want to choose to turn off Paint Symmetry. And this will be about 4,000 faces, so we'll just let that process. And this is the mesh that we receive, which this is a lot better than having it the way it was before with the metaball geometry. And so now we can actually, let's see, go under physics, which one's physics, it's this one. And we'll go to pressure, 0.5, <clears throat> shift A, we'll put a plane down here and we'll make the plane a wire object Sorry for a moment, I forgot what was going on. And we'll just put a collision and we'll just let that simulate. So the, the subdivision's making it a little slow. 
So what we'll do is put the cloth above the sub D so it simulates it and then it just runs a sub D on it. And this is our result. So I just wanted to show what I've been up to with Metaballs and also why I am um, adding support for that in the HardOps helper. In fact, the HardOps helper should support all mesh types, including, um, you know, um, Irradiance probes and, and that fun stuff. Let's see, just to test that out, Irradiance probe, control tilde. We have options for that. Um, just test another one, random Q map, of course. Uh, just to make sure one more, we got an armature, control tilde, of course, and our constraint panel. Nice. So with that, that is Metaballs to Hops Helper. So with Sword, in an ideal situation, you would have Sword on and you would be working and you would just work and cut and things would happen and it would be great and nothing would bother you and you would never question why. However, in some situations, you wanna just bypass Sword and just get to that next level, like right here. I don't wanna cut like that. Instead, if we hover over this, we can see that there's a control option of holding control, clicking to bypass sort. And now if we take this moment to control shift click on bevel, we can actually add an additional bevel at this level. And this bevel will remain non-destructive along with this cut, which is also non-destructive with our main cut also remaining non-destructive and this bevel also continuing to be non-destructive. So it's just a non-destructive party everywhere. In fact, we can even control shift click at an additional level, press X to drop that as a half bevel, shift D, duplicate, bring this out, S, Y, to cut this in where difference and then give it thickness and now we have three levels of bevel on the same object, but the shading's off. So we can shift click on weighted normal and just add, you know, I think I'm just gonna remove the whole shift clicking on this and just make it where that's the default, you know, just flip the two and the director's cut, um, which will be the next release or next major update. You know, we'll just talk about that, maybe do some tests on it, see what the standard cases are but we will now cut this piece in and we can see now that we're cutting on an individual level here. Let's, let's do that again, but we lost our piece. So we want to mod scroll to bring that back. And we haven't yet taken a moment to talk about the evolution of mod scroll and bull scroll and how I've tried to unify them in this particular version. I'm hoping that you guys are actually into it. I've caught a little bit of kickback on it, but I believe that we can actually get this idea together and have it work smartly in every situation without having a button, bunch of buttons everywhere to intimidate new users. So here we are, multiple levels of bevel. And if we wanted to, we could either add an additional bevel that we could catch later with our next bevel, with our next Boolean, or we can actually just bypass the sort and we would bypass the sort, meaning we would bypass everything here except for weighted normal. So just to show that in action, control click in order to bypass the sort. And so we're the final modifier after everything, but before weighted normal, because we do not want to affect the shading. And the same thing is happening with bevel. So when I control shift click, it will add a bevel, but it will add it before the level that we're talking about here. And this is exactly the result that we want. And I could take this, array it on the Y axis over here to the other side. And we have multiple levels of bevel all being controlled individually. In fact, we could press Control Shift B to bring up the bevel helper, which Control Shift B should definitely be the bevel helper. I believe I mentioned earlier in the video that that's debatable, but really the bevel helper is the bevel helper. Um, interactive Boolean needs its own hotkey. Maybe one to two keys and not three. But now with this bevel helper open, we can just modify each of these levels to try to get an either tighter result. Um, we can add more segments to it. Sometimes I like to jump these earlier levels up a bit. You know, we'll round it out, but not so much that we break the later levels. 
now we'll play with the second level, which is this bevel. It was kind of big there, so we'll dial it back, maybe give it double the segments. This one, by clicking on the multiply divide, we can actually highlight which one is which. And you can see that by playing with the sizes, we actually broke down this area. So there's a couple of ways we could actually bring this back. One is just pressing Q and using mod scroll toggle, which by looking at the tool tip, you can see is a very busy tool. We can see that it does bull scroll, modifier scroll, toggle modifiers, apply modifiers, and also toggle modifier scroll, which I believe is also modifier scroll. I just set it up as a fallback. So we'll just use left mouse click to bring back our last cutter and just bring it back just a tad and we are good to go. But this whole area is just a geometric modifier complexity mess all in itself, just kind of self-contained, but still very non-destructive, very dynamic. I get a lot of questions about controlling multi-level bevels and hopefully this just kind of uh, gives some insight to that. So I um, you know, finally stop having to tell people, yes, it is definitely non-destructive is non-destructive every time that or at least every time that you ask for it and you tweak it into place to get it just right just like this so with that on to the next thing so to the gumroad customers out there i must apologize for sending launch versions anytime a launch version comes out sometimes i get caught up in the moment and i send you guys the launch version in the email i'm not supposed to do that I'm supposed to make you guys actually get on the sales page and download it from there because that way we can actually update the download before you get to it in the event that you're a late downloader we can actually fix it before you download the product this is actually one of the benefits of blender market is that on blender market you can when you go and download the product we've already had the ability to curate and make sure that it's definitely the product that we want you to download so to everyone who received the very first iteration of this thorium release I apologize because there was a sorting issue where if you selected a box and selected another one with the bevel and you did a controlled numpad minus, it would actually bypass the sort. And this is because if we say duplicate this cube and we look at different, you can see that control bypasses sort. Just so by pressing control numpad minus to do a cut, you actually bypass the sort, which is something we didn't take into consideration over the course of development which is silly, I know, we're terrible, but it's just one of those things that happens. Things were quite hectic, it was also the holidays and I'm a slave driver, but it was just, um, you know, the circumstances. But I'll just let you know that if you get the latest update as of now, we have that issue resolved and things should now be performing much better for you. But just to let you know that that was something that we were quite aware of and we immediately went and got that rectified. In the previous video, or uh, in the previous segment, I referred to the latest hard ops version as Thorium. It's actually Thulium. I must apologize to any physicists I might have offended. So continuing on, another thing that we changed in this particular release is the apply. So uh, Smart Apply is pretty crazy with the control click to convert it to a curve, which isn't going to work in this context because it's a very large manifold, dense manifold cube. But if we were to apply the modifiers, normally it would just apply all the modifiers and that would just be it. It would just be a, a, a model with all its modifiers applied. No questions asked. Well, now we've actually made a few changes where if you run Smart Apply on a model, it would actually apply every modifier up to the final bevel and, and weight it normal and leave these last two, similar to the way C Sharp used to be. So in the event you're needing to apply something just kind of smartly, where you can still tap into edit mode, grab things, press P, separate by loose parts, and then come and slap just you know random materials on these things without having that last bevel applied because maybe that last bevel you still want to adjust, but the rest of the levels you want to just move past. In fact, in this case, it's kind of a little crazier, but it is just an experimental idea that we're working with. But in the absence of C sharp and being kept in operation. We definitely want to move our apply behaviors 
and the intelligence that we put in C-Sharpen into apply and make it smart enough to work for you, the user. So if you get any ideas with it as you're using it, like, hey, it should work good in this case, but not in this case, you know, definitely let us know. Um, I'll just uh, select everything, delete it, and we'll just bring in a plane and we'll, we'll just jump into hops tool for a moment. So we'll, we'll start with corner bevel. So corner bevel, whenever you click it, adds a way to adds a weld modifier in a 2.82. So we'll just take that and, and the weld will prevent it from, uh, you know, the points from having a junction issue. We'll S sharp it just to a hard surface, smooth it. And we'll just, adjust our chamfer and then from here adjust the micro bevel and we're just playing with the shape here oh uh, sorry I, I i keep thinking i'm using box cutter that's what happens there i keep thinking i'm using box cutter and i just start that's how hard i am into box cutter now you guys so i'm gonna select these two shapes use a difference notice that it only puts it to the last bevel We'll jump into sharpen and that'll get things looking right. I was about to jump into bevel because I, I want bevel to also fix things as well. Like a big problem that I have internally is that I make these tools over scope. I mean, I make fun of other people for over scoping, but I give myself a special exception because I'm the guy who's driving the tool, you know, but um, I am very guilty of trying to make bevel be a sharpener in addition to adding weighted normals, in addition to being a resharpener, and all this just crazy stuff. But we're messing with this hop shape and just adding stuff to it. And this is just to show smart apply in action because the thing was, was I was playing with this. This is, um, you know, kind of how I do so one of the hops tests is um, I will just go through and just and notice right there, because I was holding control, I activated the bypass. So that's something that more than likely we will need to come back and fix. Also, I could see that we need to probably add half bevel to new bevel inside of um, hops tool, which is something that we're also still working on perfecting that I haven't even went over yet. But as I'm adding these modifiers here, I'm just kind of just Densing up the place, just working this corner. I, I just love doing this uh, particular little exercise as a tool test. You know, some of these things I'll just model over and over just to make sure that the tools are working at their most efficient. But, you know, everything we've talked about over the course of this video should lead you to um, being able to do what, what you see me doing here because I just shift A, insert a shape, choose my favorite Boolean operation, and, you know, it's a done deal. So we're just, you know, we'll look at this from the bottom, just move that right off that corner there. And we'll just mirror this to the other side using modifier in the Alt X mirror gizmo. And you see how I had to bring it up twice. You don't even have to do that. I choose to do that because old habits die hard, but you could actually shift click to keep them. So right here, we have a whole stack of modifiers. If I wanted to just exit out of Hop's tool, uh, let's give it a blank material. If I wanted to just exit out of this workflow and move on to the next thing, which is, I don't know, placing this somewhere else or um, having having fun with this model um, or setting it up for render or using it as a linked instance or you know whatever the case may be. Now I can go under Operation Smart Apply and it will apply everything down to the second to final bevel and the weighted normal. And this actually makes it a lot easier. And also I wanted to avoid mirror too. So I may actually revisit that and have that done in the next round. But you know, even as I play with these tools, ideas come to me. So we'll select all four of these, join them together, give that a blank material, and let's jump into render and see what we get. Because I give these random materials out here and then not until you go under, oh, okay, so I lost. This material is a loser. And we can press uh, Alt V for EVHQ. And there we go. So now we kind of have our model set up to render. But 
now it's actually exited out, you know, broken free of all the uh, modifiers to help build this thing up. So I do hope to expand on Smart Apply sometime in the future and make it even smarter. But that's where we are for now with it. For so long, I've actually requested the ability to add a bevel at half of the previous bevel. However, I think the way that I asked for it was uh, not always the most articulate, which resulted in difficulty in receiving it because when I asked Proxy for it, he said, here's how you do it in one line. And I was like, oh my God. And now we're talking about bevel half. So the problem is, you know, you put a bevel on a model, so far so good, right? But you're like, you know what? I don't want to cut. God, there I am thinking about box cutter again, sorry. So the thing is, you don't want to cut on that level. You want to cut on another level. So you add another level of bevel on here. So we'll just add another level, but we have no idea what depth or amount of bevel this is at. And so we could just start from zero and just give it a really small number, but that really isn't good enough. So now enter X by pressing X, you will now set the bevel to half of the previous bevel. So when you do your next cut, the bevel will always be exactly half of the previous bevel, giving you the ability to get a bevel just right. So we'll just add another bevel, press X to drop that bevel at half, and we'll just bring this cube down and cut it in, and we have our bevel exactly where we need it, at least with a starting point of us getting it to the correct size. So if you're stacking up bevels and you're unable to tell what your size is because it's currently being obscured by not being in play yet, try pressing X to just drop it, and then you'll be able to activate it on your next cut and at least get an acceptable visual result. So this area is a type of cut that's you know smooth shaded auto smooth and might be a scenario that you've recognized before you know uh for me personally i like to go in and i'll lower to auto smooth i'll go down to 60 maybe 45 maybe 30 and find just a number that works for me for this angle of course um you know i want to bring the face out and get get even more rotation going here maybe something like that right um, and so for this, I have to go down even lower, like maybe to something like 15. So the problem comes up whenever I want to escalate this up to a bevel. So if I press control and click to add a bevel, this is my bevel with the angle of 30 and 30 is just not going to cut it. What I actually need is a, an angle of 15, which is the bevel being set to the auto smooth parameter. So now the object is beveled exactly where I need it according to the auto smooth that I just defined a moment ago. So when I click to apply this, I can actually now go here and set the auto smooth to something like 60 and I get the nice round bevel, but I also get the bevel exactly where I need it for on this particular surface. So this is something that we're still kind of um, in the brainstorming phases of, but whenever I had it working in hops, thanks to proxy, you know, he's just in a background. He's like a, a Wikipedia or a questionnaire. I just am like, hey, how do I do this in one line? He's like, this is the line. I'm like, oh my God, that's the craziest thing I've ever heard. You know, I actually have a scrapbook of the epic answers I get out of proxy sometimes. Whenever you catch him at the right moment when the moon is full, he will give you the greatest answers you've ever heard. But that aside, just know that during bevel, A is your friend to jump between the auto smooth angle or uh, to jump between the angle parameter of 30, 60, or whatever your auto smooth is set to. Now this has to be in contrast to one, which will change your auto smooth to be either 30 or 60. So use each of them sparingly, depending on the circumstance and direction in which you're trying to work. But this is just something that we're experimenting with. I hope to further it farther in the future, but just to show you, uh, just an idea that we've implemented into Bevel to help you with your shading for specific angle types of cut. All right, so this section of the video refers to uh, kind of the uh, final release version, uh, just kind of an overview of some of the things that were changed post-release that had to be changed for various reasons. Like for example, uh, in edit mode, 
uh, let me go into edit mode. Uh, whenever you press control on numpad minus, it would bring up the modal, which uh, was kind of a good idea in theory. However, uh, the modal is actually a little more unstable than we wish. So I have a fun time playing with it personally. However, in some more complex scenes, it can sometimes get a little bit tricky. Um, so just one of those things to keep in mind. However, you are able to uh, modify your key map to bring back uh, hops dot bull underscore modal. Uh, but you know in object mode it is set to control shift B while it is being perfected because I do feel it will be a Mainstay at some point in the future another thing is if we uh, go ahead and add a bevel here and we put a weighted normal on top of it um, Whenever you add a difference even in a bypass state It should bypass weighted normal. I mean it should sort weighted normal and skip that that part is just non-negotiable for me. So in the end, that was one of the final cuts that uh, I felt had to be made because the alternative is, is literally having the, the shading look terrible. And so it's imperative for me, at least personally, that we have the shading look good at all times. I mean, even as I'm writing this, I'm receiving notes from proxy about my terrible Python skills and the mistakes I made over the course of writing small things that I just wanted to create prototypes for. To be honest, there's actually two alternative prototypes of Sharpen inside of hard ops that are kind of connected to this idea of the hard ops that never was. The next thing is um, bull shapes. Uh, here we have a bull shape. If you press Q, you'll notice that Sharpen isn't there anymore. I removed that. Also, um, after discussing with Bongiorno uh, some of the verbiage, he uh, kind of reminded me that in the bull shape menu, we could kind of leave some of the classic verbiage here to actually uh, kind of ease users a little bit easier because there's no reason to just rename it to Solidify and uh, or rename it to uh, t thick or just call it just straight solidify you know we could leave the t and actually continue helping users and for the time being for people that are using the qd system i guess that is what i'm going to call it from now on so just one of those things the other thing is that you know we did a an immense amount of changes to the main menu so you know i'll try to talk about some of those um also union was broken Union has now been fixed, uh, just to show that in action. In fact, um, you know, control plus, that's our union. However, um, what I wanna do here is take these two and, you know, we wanna join it, but we wanna bypass the sort and then control shift add a bevel ourselves just to uh, just bevel just that area. And we can also maybe even lower the angle on that by just isolating that bevel, maybe jump it down to 30. And we're beveling just way too much. Maybe 45, maybe 40, still too much. So it's just not gonna let us catch that right there unless we uh, angle it just a bit. So maybe something like that. And then we have an angle to catch there. And so now we have this area that has its own isolated bevel, just uh, goofing off that, but just basically showing that we, we, we went back and fixed Union. It, it was terrible that that was broken on Christmas Day. So many people pointed it out. And so, you know, we were, we were on it. Um, I feel terrible for having a team work on Christmas. Uh, personally, because of my childhood, I work on every holiday forever because I'm just the Scrooge. But... I shouldn't do that to my team. I'm, I'm a terrible guy. If anyone, if people ever quit, it'd probably be because of my uh, eternal work ethic. Like all I am is a box at this point. I'm like more box than men. But continuing on, so the the scroller has been combined into like this omni scroll. So if you have pending booleans on your model, this thing will begin showing up in your queue menu. And so the default operation is just bull scroll, which is classic. Everybody loves bull scroll. Bull scroll's innocent, it can't crash. All it does is scroll through your booleans. But if you shift click it, you can actually scroll additively through your modifiers. Of course, pressing L to just scroll through them over and over. If you wanna just scroll through it over and over. Um, let's see, back in object mode, we also have control click that will toggle them off and on. 
In fact, as I look at this, I see that maybe I could put smart apply in here, but I actually want to create some sort of like unified system for making the tools customizable, but customizable through like an external UI that's uh, connected into the preferences so people can get the tools just the way they want and then save it across versions so we don't have these sort of tool disconnects happening in the future. I mean, we're definitely not trying to disrupt anyone's workflow. The other thing I probably didn't go into enough focus on it is I'm immensely proud of bull scroll. I mean, uh, of uh, bull shift. Uh, I should call it bull shift here, but shift bull just kind of flows better in the menu. But part of the director's cut is that you have to press X to switch this. At the time that uh, Bongiorno was making this, I remember telling him, I was like, hey, I'm going to need to press X to switch through it. And uh, he told me, uh, I don't know, that's not such a good idea. And so I just, you know, stopped talking in that conversation as I typically do when I encounter resistance on, on, on something that I uh, interpret as a, as a request related to the task at hand that you are been assigned. But that aside, for the most part, it's, it's definitely uh, important that you're able to press X for this just in case you don't have a scroll wheel. But that was uh, also part of the director's cut of, um, you know, this final modification of getting hops just right. You know, I keep saying director's cut, but really I'm just referring to the fact that after everyone has agreed upon things, I go in and spend an entire night just breaking everything and tweaking it to really get hops the way that I personally feel I want to deliver it to you to customers and I take that very seriously like the version that I have you use and follow tutorials with uh, you know is sacred to me so when we were breaking up S sharpen and C sharpen you know we, we fought like uh, like hell internally in fact let me get rid of this box that box sucks let's just bring in a plane and I'm just gonna work casually and talk but um, you know just just us talking you and me but, um, you know, we decided to uh, examine S Sharp and we fought like cats and dogs for days. Um, AR has been a partner on this for the entirety of, of Hops' creation, basically, and is a very crucial element. And, you know, the, the, the decision to break apart S Sharp, C Sharp into their respective tasks and just rebuild them, you know, really opened a can of worms because, you know, for one, we were changing the core of the tool but also we were going away in which we weren't going to be looking back so it just wasn't the um i keep trying to use box cutter still i really like box cutter. i'm sorry it's like my favorite tool that isn't hard ops uh or decal machine or bezier mesh shaper or mirror tools you know I, I love a lot of tools also love snapping pies quite a bit but um, you know, we, we fought quite a bit over the tool. I mean, not like, you know, we're, we're not going to work together or like this deal is over sort of thing, but really just what it was that we wanted it to be because, you know, our, our workflows diverge quite a bit. Um, you know, like, um, we, we agree on most things, but you know, AR has this pie menus and I have my Q menus. And after that, we kind of go our own routes with it. Um, I mean, we're, we're connected for the most part as far as uh, menu agreements, but it really kind of exposed that it was a more serious undertaking. You know, one doesn't just remake the sharpeners uh, willy nilly. So at the same time that we're dealing with that, we're also dealing with a uh, new guy, Bonjay, who's like, you know what, I'm trying to re rewrite all the bullions that customers have come to know and love. and uh they may not work entirely correct also the tool tips may not exist like all these things that just um really added to the release so it's kind of a really hectic time for us so i mean you know it, it's really unusual even for me to sit here and do a post release on this but you know i think this is just fun information because s sharpen you know we we originally uh i, I originally made it based off of a discussion i had with them and so this new one is finally one where um we finally rewrote it from scratch in a more collaborative fashion i mean he's rewritten it before and then i'll go modify it and then he'll fix what i'll modify and then i'll um make make changes to it until finally he's like you know what i'm gonna rewrite it again and then you know we're on the next version so s sharp received like many many versions before we finally got to now where 
you know, um, I received a particular comment that, you know, comments stick with me. You know, anytime I receive a negative comment, I just I stare out at the lake. I stare out at the lake and I just think about it, you guys. Like, I just think about these cruel words that I get sometimes. Like, you know, sometimes I'll eat a pizza and just, you know, just cry into that pizza. No, I'm kidding. I do not. But the thing is, is uh, negative comments about people having uh, issues getting used to hops or, wow, hops is so complex or I wish... Hops could be more basic to use. It's like, well, I mean, you know, the alternative is actually not using hops, and that's very complex to me. But, you know, when I put put aside that, it made me realize that there were some improvements to be made. You know, Box Cutter received an entire revolutionary revisit for 2.8. And so with, with Hard Ops, we didn't give it a revisit. But anyways, back to my story. So... There we are, uh, fighting a Moxie, not, not Proxy, by the way, Proxy was supervisor, so he was just watching us, like, he's like, dude, whatever you decide to do, I'll just execute, it's like, oh, well, in the meantime, I can't execute anything unless AR agrees, because otherwise, I'm just going off the reservation, and, you know, it's it's not a team project if I do things based on, if, if we're doing things for selfish reasons, like, um, I, I do love the fact that our job is to please you, the customer, the hypothetical customer. I mean, maybe not you specifically, you, the guy watching the video, but the idea of you, yes, we're trying to hypothetically please you, the customers as a whole. So, I mean, you know, people are ask, people always ask for weird stuff. You know, I got a guy who asked me for blue boxes to be alive, which it drives me nuts. Like, guy, that's not possible. When blue boxes are capable of being live, it'll, it'll, I'll, I'll, I'll make it a thing, but it can't be live. You know, like the only reason we don't delete blue boxes is because I just don't want to delete blue boxes. I need them. Or uh, not blue boxes, knife boxes. But when he saw that we did knife boxes, he immediately thought we did live knife box. Like, that's just not possible. But uh, I'm not giving him a, a red light to keep driving me crazy with it because it'll um, drive me insane. But... You know, the comments definitely stick with me. And so, you know, everything as far as changing everything, like it, it was written on the whiteboard for the longest. So it was, I had this idea to do what's called, what I was going to call a unity tool, like a tool that brought m multiple tools together and then do like a multi-tool, which would be like a, uh, like a concept unity tool that would um, be like a smart tool that would handle multiple unity tools and their uh, different behaviors. But you know, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not the smartest guy on the team. I'm uh, probably the least smart guy on the team. So that's also uh, becomes a problem sometimes because, you know, language will, will get in the way, you know, working with people in a variety of places. Like, um, you know, even though me and Proxy both live in America, I was talking to him about something called parent sort. And he's like, what the heck, dude? You just make up words while you're talking. You know, like, what is parent sort? Like, I don't get that. Is that sort? Is that regular sort? It's like, Jesus, dude. <laughs> like, oh my God. I, I don't realize it happening, but I, you know, I just start putting things together and start rationalizing them in my head. So that's why inside of Hard Ops, there's like a multiple concepts of the sharpen tool because I had way different ideas for it. I wanted a tool that unified all of our previous work. But AR wanted something that actually went forward. And so, you know, we, we disagreed on it quite a bit until finally it, I realized he was right. You know, I, I don't mind actually admitting to him that he's right because um, he, he will often be right. You know, same thing happens with Proxy, except I don't never want to tell Proxy that he's right because he's like, all right, so that means I'm going to do this, this, and this. Like, well, please, no, please act on nothing or else we'll end up in a work quagmire. Uh, unable to uh, give anything to our shareholders for a couple of months. So when we finally came to an agreement with it, you know, our final compromise was to bring in the classic C sharp, which I, I don't even plan on using, to be honest, because I literally add my bevels manually. But, you know, it was the battle of the century. And as a result, as a result of all this infighting about Sharpen, Bongiorno took the opportunity to think that, you know, we, that's how we live. We're just a, a group of rude dudes, you know, that hops is just like some 
playground where you just uh, you come in and just do what you want, you know. And there's no no um, no path forward, no task, no vision. But really, he just caught us at a very pandemonium time. But um, as a result, he was able to create a very interesting Boolean tool because you know we were so preoccupied with like a bajillion changes in underlying systems, you know, like. Um, <laughs> one of the ultimate insults that um, AR can possibly say to me personally is I'm not testing things like oh my god I get so angry when he says that and he'll say it all the time he's like you didn't test anything I'm like what do you mean I am the tester it's my job to make sure that you know these tools are working I mean I probably sound bitchy and complaining here but you know I just wanted to kind of cast some light on just how these things go in between releases because I mean it's not all just easy breezy also bevel did not work out somewhere here and I need to find out where well actually how could this have felt it's just a single plane but I wouldn't trade it for the world like if anything AR is literally like it like an older brother you know who's like <laughs> when I met him, he was like, let me show you something cool with modeling. And that literally became sharpening. So zero doubt about it. No hops without him. But just a really interesting release. Um, like next time, we should not be touching so many parts at the same time. It's probably a more or less story. Um, like normally we don't, you know, try to dissect the brains of our tools. Like all of them. Also, that bevel will not work out. There has to be a way to keep that bevel and make it work out. I mean, why does that fail? So let's Alt V, go into face orientation. And we got flip normals, so let's look at this. Let's uh, make sure these normals are the right direction. Yes. Let's change this to complex. And that will work. So we're able to just keep flying. Uh, the new system that they've added to solidify of complex, I've still been experimenting with it. Like I want to make it the default, but I find cases where it doesn't work. And so, you know, as long as it's like has a higher failure rate, it um, doesn't work. Now, alternatively to, you know, uh, continuing back to the, the backstory of this release, because uh, yeah, I just find it to be an interesting one is um you know all throughout all of this i received an immense amount of phone calls I, I literally just stopped taking phone calls because um my brain was on this hops thing like i, I drew all these pictures uh, if i remember I'll, I'll show some on the screen but i draw a lot of sketches of of tool ideas and these these ideas like never quite cease to be unless not even joking unless i send it to proxy if i send it to proxy there's a good chance that it will either come out like that idea or better, um, which is one of his strong suits is that he's able to take ideas, not even prototypes. He doesn't even require a prototype. He just needs an idea and take that and turn it into something. So, I mean, that's the type of potential I see in Bonjay. However, me and AR, you know, let me and him, we'll make a prototype and keep refining a prototype until it becomes something applicable. Uh, and then when it becomes a um, like an actual tool, then we stop calling it a prototype. Or at least me, I, I do that. I, I'm sorry, I, I'm just not a program developer. You know, people always ask me, like, how do I come up with version names and stuff like that? Like, I figured that if we named things after elements that when people wrote with support issues, I would know exactly what the heck they were talking about. So people actually are very specific with support issues. Like when you write in and you're like, hey man, I'm having a problem with this zip, with this version, this zip, oh my God, I love you. You are the, you are the customer that we need. I mean, we need every customer, <laughs> that's terrible to say, but uh, I definitely love getting very specific support answers. Uh, you know, anytime I link you to page helping us help you, it's because I do need that information to help us help you because people send me these emails and they're just so ambiguous on information that it frustrates me. Um, they're like, hey man, I can't draw a box. I'm like, uh... Yeah, you know, I just sent him up to up the chain. I'm like, hey, <laughs> look at this email, guys. <laughs> this guy, yeah, I can't believe this. Um, but 
you know, the better the information you give us, the better we can help you. Um, I, I was particularly proud of, of this last box cutter release. So, I mean, I really haven't even been working proxy at all. Um, there, there's really no need to. The 715 release, I feel, has been a success. There's still some improvements that need to be made to grid. But for the most part, uh, he's, he's well deserved a break or a month off or whatever he wants to do. Um, anything to keep him wanting to work with us because, like I said, it's quite hard, at least in my opinion, working with me because all I talk and think about are boxes. And every time I look at something, I'm like, all right, well, that's great. Well, let's talk about what it could be. Let's talk about what it should be next the next level like this is level one right here this is a great level i love that i love calling something just that level because it opens it up to be able to say well the next level would definitely be something like this and you know the glorious thing about working with everyone is you know you throw an idea out there and they'll either tell you hey that's kind of, that idea makes no sense silly or you know they'll they'll adopt it they'll jump on it they'll co-opt it um, like all the time these conversations come up where I'm like hey this feature you did so and so is just fantastic I still love it it's one of my favorite features and I'll be like did I write that it's like yeah we're looking at the code it shows that you wrote it you know xx years ago um, like those sort of things you know mean a lot to me and so you know even to you the user who's uh, using this plugin you know I, I value your time investment into our tool so we definitely want to keep this tool moving forward without wasting any of your time. We, I mean, we want to make it as fast as possible. And so this menu cleanup business is only to put in even more efficient options like an atom. You know, we're just uh, expanding out and bringing it all together. But I would consider this the new hop. So, you know, I, I wouldn't mind hearing that there's some users that are like, you know what, I don't like the new hops. But you know what? All we can do is, um, you know, put callbacks to the old hops. But they're, they're, we can't go back to the old hops because we were already way past it already in 2.8 when they put, when we started dealing with sorting and all these other things. These are systems that were to literally take over and be superior to the whole C sharp thing, while also working a hand with them. But now we're finally seeing, you know, what I keep thinking like, wow, I could just draw a box there, box cutter. Just box cutter, guys. <laughs> I mean, I haven't used any box cutter in this video, but boy, I used the heck out of some box cutter right there. Um, I know this video was a terrible tutorial. Um, I'm just going through and just showing features and blabbering. And then at the end, I'm just dropping cubes and cutting a box over and over and just talking to you all about the behind the scenes. But I just want y'all to know that it, it is due to the support and people, you know, having word of mouth and telling other people about hops that our team is able to expand and that the features get crazier. I mean, eventually there will be only dream level jobs being done, like only tasks that are drawn straight from paper without us having to think about how to uh, deal with the hard parts of Blender. Like, um, you know, for me, I always try to do things manually, like like hard knock. So I will do something and then just try to make sure it works 100% of the time for the scenarios in which I present it in, and then call that a day, and then not think about the scenarios that other people may face, which then become what we call bugs. But there's other dimensions to it. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm definitely no coder, but over the course of this release, I did Get in, the, get in the paint and write a bit of code. I mean, uh, seeing Bongiorno 7 work with us made me want to get in there and work too. You know, every feature begats more features. I can just look at the code that someone just put into something and see other places it can be used. So even Late Parent was made from me staring at some work Proxy did in Box Cutter for Apply Modifiers. I was like, dang, you do some crazy stuff with these cutters, dude. It'd be crazy if you could grab each of those cutters and actually um, parent them to the mesh. It, it would just be so fantastic. And so Late Parent was born. But Late Parent is nowhere near what the prototype was. But I was told that the prototype was not written correctly and possibly had, you know, interdimensional ramifications that 
I wasn't ready for it to smoke on if I gave to you the users. So that's why the current one is a little bit neutered. But if you have the original version, the experimental version is there and it also should work. But I think that version might also have been neutered. So, you know, we're just going to bring that last bull shape back, this one, duplicate it and go under settings and shade solid. And we're going to move that to collection one. And we're just going to put a loop here, separate selection, delete that, grab this. And we want to control click smart apply in order to turn that into a loop. And we'll just mirror that to the other side. And that's all I was going for there. And so we'll snap our cursor there, put a cube there. I mean, when it comes to explaining hard ops, it, geez, I mean, I'm already working on a bunch of videos about hard ops. So y'all can stop writing me about needing hard ops videos. And wow, it'd be so good if Master Xeon did videos about hard ops. Jesus, what do y'all think I'm doing? Uh, also, whenever I'm not working on videos about hops, we're working on stuff for hops or hops itself or box cutter. Um, but, you know, I'm at this thing 24 hours a day. So the more you guys push this thing, the more invested I'll be with time. It's already getting to the level where I feel like I should probably stop taking jobs and just work on hops all the time because you guys really want hops. You probably want hops more than um, I want uh job achievements which is what i would be pursuing if i wasn't working on hops i would just be trying to get you know get, get some get some credits you know i still need to live my life stream of working on halo so but working on hops has definitely become way bigger than i ever thought it would be so i'm, I'm grateful to everyone who uh, you know shouts this thing out uh, helps further the word because it, it's really turned this thing into a massive undertaking where you know people's lives are transformed um, you know one of the things I talk about on the sales page is helping disadvantaged artists um, I, you know I never want to put any of those artists you know on blast but just know that there are plenty of people that have been helped through y'all literally purchasing and uh, just being a part of hard ops so I hope to uh, do a fundraiser in the future through one of our ads, but in the meantime, uh, I'd rather not jinx it by, you know, getting it sabotaged or something. But th this product, um, you know, someday I want it to be something that helps bring people to 3D. You know, I always joke about the idea of making like a 3D monastery coffee shop where people come in and just use hops cutter. But I'm telling you, it'd be my contribution to the world. So continuing on, uh, what else is there to talk about while I'm uh, talking about internal beans at Hops Co? Um, I think that is it really because everything else was uh, pretty much fine. I mean, the, the whole uh, sharpen frenzy was just nuts. So I was like, wow, AR. <laughs> uh, you got a lot of passion on this thing. I had no idea. Also, you should just let me handle it, you know, which is probably his least favorite thing to hear me say because it means I'm going to go in and write some terrible code that will do the job, but just not do the job he likes, meaning he'll have to fix it. So it's a very interesting dichotomy that we have. Um, you know, proxies almost become like a, like a big brother on the team. Just um, looking over code while writing code and helping make sure that uh, everybody's uh, at least writing things that isn't utter garbage, you know, um, make their standards. So it's been fun being able to treat this as a uh, as a as a commercial endeavor. And you guys, the, the shareholders, the, the, the people who require excitement, require entertainment, require that. We come out the gate and we, we, we show you a pretty ad and, you know, we have some enhancements to put them other boys to shame. You know, we got to be the ones to show how it's done. And that was what we set out to do, to be honest. Like at the very beginning, uh, I felt that Blender add-ons were a graveyard. I thought that there were not very many tools being developed that had communities that were very interesting that kept going. 
I felt that, um, you know, tools were kind of one and done. You know, people were just dropping them like, look at this curve, just terrible. Let's apply the scale on that. All right. But yeah, I mean, it, this is just my opinion, by the way, not saying that this is the fact, but, you know, I felt like uh, Blender tools were a bit of a graveyard. So, you know, our goals have definitely been to not only make Blender more entertaining, but to just kind of uh, create an ecosystem, uh, like a scene around the Blender tools. And I think that's been pulled off to an even greater level than I ever would have thought. So, you know, I spent 30 additional minutes just slaving over a hot box for you guys just so we can have a conversation. And now I've slapped some blank materials on it. So let's jump over to render mode and see what we have, not that, let's jump over to look dev and see what our lottery of materials looks like. I like doing this with proxy because I complain to him about the colors. I'm like proxy, let's look at our lottery. Actually, this is a good lottery right here. Um, you know, this one could have been metallic, but other than that, that's a good lottery. That's good material. And that was the goal is to get users into Blender, having fun and just rendering things just without a whole lot of effort. So I'm hoping that, you know, there's more people who are encouraged by my videos to do this stuff and to try it than there are that are discouraged because that definitely isn't the goal. I mean, I hope I said it earlier, but I mean, I don't do these videos where I'm talking to, uh, you know, floss on you guys or like show off or be like, yeah, I'm a, such a great modeler. Cause I'm not, I'm just a guy cutting boxes, you know, but just to try to encourage everyone to just, you know, get in there and give it a try, you know, regardless of your tools, just get in there, get the box city. But I hope everybody's enjoying this latest update of hard ops. And with that, I'll wrap this video up and I'll see you guys next time.